the open scroll the testimony of Gethsemane part 3 your final exam Gethsemane was quite probably the location of the most intense emotional experience ever recorded from the scene of the Last Supper the Son of Man's journey to the cross visited this place of the olive press for a critical interlude the account of this interlude is a love story so deep and vast it can only be understood in reality by following in our Lord's footsteps. Not by walking in the physical location on the Mount of Olives, but on your way to the cross. In this article, I will show how the willingness to follow Yeshua to the cross will be a basis for the eventual threefold division of His beloved Church. Picking up the theme of division from understanding that the location is on the Mount of Olives, we are now able to learn the significance of what happened there and glean fresh insight into why it was such an emotional time. And we learn why it has such relevance to you and I, who greatly desire to be presented to the bridegroom as a pure and chaste bride. Though the moon was nearly full, Arising in the east over Jerusalem, as Yeshua and his disciples were supping together in the upper room, the twilight arrival of this Nisan 13 swiftly became a deeply dark time as the heaviness of what was about to happen began to build towards the extreme sorrow of the Gethsemane experience. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, so, you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. For those of you seeking more insight, you may find a study of the Greek word used for heavy in verse 43 to be enlightening. I want to point out a technical feature of this passage. It is at the center of an introverted structure. The surrounding context points inward to it from either side, highlighting it as the focal section. Just prior to the Gethsemane account and just after it, the unity-division contrast appears. See John 14 verse 1 through chapter 17 verse 26 and John 18 verses 2 through 9. Bracketing that, the matter of the swords appear in Luke 22 verses 35 through 38 and Luke 22 verses 39 through 53. Bracketing those, the matter of the rooster crowing, denying, and falling away appears in Mark 14, 27 through 31 and Mark 14 verses 50 through 72. Given the emotional intensity of Yeshua and the disciples as they sorrowed, that's not too surprising an observation. But, since it's so emphatically brought to our attention, as students of the deeper things, we ought to make appropriate note of it. The stage is set for high drama. There are very important lessons for us to be learned from what took place in the heart of that passage, friends. Given the intensity of the prophetic scenario pouring out of the pages of the record of that most dreary 13th of Nisan, it seems likely that the reason our Lord was exceedingly sorrowful was because he was cognizant of the millions of martyrs who would join him on his journey 
to the cross over the next two millennia. It is no secret that martyrdom is a key theme in the context of Gethsemane because our Lord was on His way to the cross. But He has invited us to follow Him, not symbolically in some shallow and insincere imitation, but literally walking as He walked the path of shame and suffering that led even unto death. Although the voice that seems to be heard all too commonly today says, because Jesus suffered and died for us, we no longer have to suffer and die. A study of what the Bible really says shows otherwise. The church has ever been and will continue to be tested, tried, and proven for its qualities of faith and love. As the end of the age approaches, the test will reach final exam stage. Friend, the time is drawn near. We will find one crucially practical directive in conclusion, and I beg you to pay very close attention, because there are precious few things you will ever read as important as this. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The temptation to save your own life instead of offering it as a willing sacrifice. The word martyr has an interesting etymology. It comes from the Greek word martus. In the Bible, it's Strong's number 3144. Martus, a witness, by analogy, a martyr. Martyr, record, witness. A martyr is a witness. When a person shows a willingness to die for something, that level of commitment, that degree of willingness testifies of their great love, giving honor to what is loved. The practical result of the martyr's ultimate act of love is that their cause or belief is furthered. When I hear about the courage and determination of my brothers and sisters in the Lord who have suffered and been put to death for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, I am deeply touched. I know that they genuinely love the Lord and that the Lord bless them a lot. I admire them. The supreme sacrifice has a great impact upon those who remain. Most importantly, however, the ultimate sacrifice for the Lord's sake is a witness to the Lord Himself of the martyr's love for Him. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. John 15, verses 12-14 through 14. Do you want to be Jesus' friend? Then do what he commands. What did he command? Love each other as he loved us. He loved us with the greatest love, laying his life down for his friends. Are you paying attention? In the context, it's not too difficult to see the implication that he laid his life down for those who do what he commands. Bride candidates. Now, listen up. If the Lord is truly your friend, lay down your life for Him. This is love that is real, genuine, sincere, and there is no greater. This is a lifestyle and also martyrdom. This passage is within the scope of the Gethsemane context, as I will shortly discuss, teaching us vital truths in preparation for that most intensely emotional accounts lesson. And you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do, because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. John 15, verses 27, through chapter 16, verse 4. Did you notice that the word kills is used in verse 2? Yes, martyrdom is the issue here. This is the martyreo, the testimony that must be born. It is related to the question, do you really love the Lord? Although this test has been relevant to this present church since the time of Stephen's stoning in Acts 7, 
The particulars of the Gethsemane account reveal that there is a more specific application intended for an appointed time, yet future, at this writing. The Lord allows us to be tested, tempted, and tried as an evaluation of our love. The ultimate test is to see if we are willing to suffer and die for His sake. This critical evaluation distinguishes between those in the church on the basis of love. People will be sorted according to whether or not we are willing to suffer for His sake. It quite effectively separates those who are insincere from those who really do love the Lord. If you think I've got a twisted view of love, you may find satisfaction in knowing that you're in the majority. However, the majority you're in company with is not good company and any satisfaction is merely temporary. The Lord chastises those whom He loves. If you don't yet know the Lord's chastisement, may I suggest that you yourself might be in serious jeopardy? Along with the invitation to come along all the way to the cross, the Lord who knows the greatest love offers comfort in the promise of great reward. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James 1 verse 12. The ultimate price paid purchases the highest reward. It's comforting, too, to know that James went through it as well as thousands of others. Their testimony is proof that the Lord comforts his people as they suffer. This is encouraging, but the encouragement necessary for you will come as you yourself endure suffering for His namesake. Temptation in this matter comes into the picture when it's time to choose whether or not to try to escape from persecution by denying Yeshua. If we fall to that temptation, we will be separated out and suffer further consequences instead of entering into reward. The directive to watch and pray so that we won't fall into temptation isn't just a suggestion an option you may want to think about. It's a command, a necessity, if you can hear it. Perhaps for some of you I've already said enough about the matter, but I will continue to lay it out as I see it so you can find further inspiration and motivation to prepare yourself, watching and praying with zeal until the appointed time arrives. There are three sets of overlapping triples I will address in this article. The first in sequence of this triad of triples appears as the Lord addresses Simon Peter by naming him three times. The next triple begins in that same brief address as the Lord declared that this man would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. Before the account of the denials draws to its conclusion, the third triple occurs as Jesus prays to his Father about the removal of the cup, then returns to the separated threesome of disciples. Each triple is very closely related in meaning to the other two, revealing truths about the threefold division of the church. Because there's so much information to assimilate in the large scope of the context under study, I've assembled a rough table of events and corresponding scripture references. And you can see in the table, on the left side of the table is the event in question, and on the right side are the columns corresponding to the four gospel accounts, Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John. And now let's carry on with the main text. The first triple. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. Luke 22, verses 31 through 34. This took place after the Last Supper on the 13th of Nisan, and, while still prior to the crossing of the Kidron over unto the Mount of Olives, it is relevant within the context of what happens at Gethsemane. It is the Lord's pronouncement of a coming test of faith, a test that would separate based upon the endurance of one's faith. When the Lord initially addresses him, saying, Simon, Simon, the repetition suggests division, the meaning of the number two. 
This is perhaps our first clue in the passage leading up to Gethsemane that the corporate church symbolized by the man Simon Peter will be divided. The Lord then names this man a third time, calling him Peter in verse 34. If you think this observation is insignificant, you're still ignorant of the fact that nothing in the Bible is trivial. Our Lord was not just being colorful in his speech when he addressed his disciple in this fashion at this time. Perfection is exhibited in every detail of our Lord's communication, and most certainly in the matter of numbering, as the man we know as Simon Peter was named a total of three times in this one brief address. The meaning of the names used are important as well. The name Simon is the Greek form of Simeon, meaning hearing. Others of the names for this man could have been used, but the Lord selected this particular name to repeat. Therefore, the aspect of hearing brought to our attention by use of the name Simon is a determining factor in whether or not faith fails. Did you catch that? The ability to hear, which absolutely includes the doing of what is heard, is the key to faith that will not fail. We need to be able to hear. Simon could certainly hear and understand exactly what the Lord was talking about, as evidenced by his reply, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. He was Simon, hearing. In verse 34, the name Peter is used in a very rare instance of the Lord addressing this man by this name alone. I believe it is even the sole occurrence of the Greek word of the form Petra. There is a connection between this occurrence and one in Matthew 16, verse 18, where the name used refers to a weak, insubstantial, or easily movable stone rather than a strong, substantial, and immovable rock. Simon was the name used the first two times, and Peter the last, comparing to the character of each of the three divisions of the church in order. The first two divisions, the bride, and then those who are the subject of Revelation 7, verses 9-17, through 17, are the Simons, those who will indeed hear and heed the warning about resisting the temptation to resist martyrdom. The final division of the church will consist of those who succumb to the temptation and deny the Lord, being the Peter company, the weak and insubstantial living stones in the temple of God. Now that I've addressed the significance of the naming, let's observe from the focal passage that when the Lord said he had prayed for Simon, he didn't pray for Satan to not sift Simon. He prayed so that Simon's faith would not fail when he would be sifted. So, what is meant by the sifting of wheat? Both this man known as Simon and the grain mentioned are symbols used in Scripture to represent the church. Simply, sifting wheat separates it. The Greek word for sifting is used only once in the Bible, here in Luke 22, verse 31. It is Strong's number 4617, Siniadzo, from Sinion, a sieve, to riddle, sift. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, riddle means to put gravel, for example, through a coarse sieve. Another meaning is to distinguish as if separating with a sieve. With regard to its relevance here, it is interesting that the usage they give is sifted the candidates for the job. The meaning given for the verb sieve is to sort into different parts. A list of some of the synonyms exhibits how perfectly this meshes with the Mount of Olives theme and reveals God's purpose in allowing Satan to sift Simon. Synonyms Separate Divide Weed out Winnow Sort assort, choose, filter out, call, pan, pick, refine, screen, sift, and strain. In the processing of wheat, the grain is separated from the stalk and chaff by threshing and winnowing. During threshing, the grain can get dirty due to conditions at the threshing floor. A sieve was used to separate the impurities from the grain. The prophetic application of the sifting of the grain is similar in principle to the purifying process for metal we read here. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. 
But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Malachi 3, verses 1-4 through 4. Satan will do the sifting primarily via the agent who has been assigned to the task, who will be allowed to sift the church, as he is also allowed to refine and purify the sons of Levi. See also 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. The Lord desires and will have a clean grain and a fine flour for acceptable sacrifice from out of this harvest age. The Lord will receive the best of the harvest from this age, from the barley harvest, and then from the wheat. As Eve was taken from out of Adam, the bride will be taken from out of the body, a bride without spot or wrinkle, a barley people. Then the wheat people will be separated out as well. I find it very interesting to note the subject of the passage that appears immediately prior to the passage that has thus far been the subject of this article. Should we not infer that there is some connection between them? You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Luke 22, verses 28-30 through 30. I submit to you that the most valuable of the grain that is sifted, passing the trial of faith, qualifies to sit on thrones and rule over a kingdom, and will eat and drink at the Lord's table in his kingdom. What an awesome privilege to be accounted worthy of such an honor, and what a price to be paid. Now, from Luke 22, verse 32, we note that what is being tested in the trial of sifting is Simon's faith. Those in the church with faith that will fail will be separated from those whose faith does not fail. Faith in what? Faith in the Lord's great ability to sustain or to even raise from the dead, and further grant according to every promise. Matthew 10, verse 32, 33, and 39. Faith can and often does fail when confronted with the threat of suffering and death. Yeshua prayed so that Simon's faith would not fail. Was his prayer request denied? Did his faith really fail? Let me ask again. Did Simon's faith fail? In Simon Peter's trial, where he was given three opportunities to deny the Lord, and he did, it sure looks like his faith failed. But that just wasn't the end of the story for Simon Peter, was it? There would come forth a people after the pattern of Simon whose faith would not fail. Simon Peter himself would be among them, as a great company of the bride who would be brought forth over the following two millennia, willing to lay down their lives for their friend Jesus. There is no greater love than this, and no more unfailing of faith. Pay close attention now. Peter's response to the Lord's revelation lays bare the nature of the trial that sifts. And he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Luke 22, verse 33. Although you can find a similar statement made by Simon in other gospel accounts, this account in Luke is unique with regard to what our Lord said that prompted this reply. It is found here in Luke because it belongs here in this precise context. Based upon what Yeshua had just said about Satan's desire to sift him like wheat and having prayed for him so that his faith would not fail, we might ask why Simon might assume that what he said had anything to do with readiness to go with his Lord to prison and to death. Up to this point in time, neither Simon Peter nor any of the other disciples had shown that they really understood about Yeshua having to suffer and die. The one called hearing must have had insight, hearing ears, in order to be able to understand the relevant truth. You see, the Lord didn't rebuke him and say, Whoa, where are you coming from with that crazy statement? Consider an earlier exchange of words between Peter and the Lord Jesus with regard to the same theme to see his ignorance about Yeshua's fate. 
From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Matthew 16, verses 21-27 through 27. While Peter didn't yet have in mind the things of God at the time of the above, the way of martyrdom had surely entered his mind on the way to Gethsemane. Given that Yeshua was now on a rather direct route to the shame, suffering, and death on the cross, this process of sifting to be granted Satan should be recognized as the process of separating people on the basis of whether or not they are ready to go that same route, on the basis of their willingness to be martyred. Are you ready to go both to prison and to death, my friend? This sifting proves who will have the greatest love and faith that will not fail. This will become even more clear as we progress through the study. Let's consider the Lord's plan for some whose faith is tested. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Luke 22, verse 32. The primary application of this interesting directive appears to be for the wheat saints of Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. I have no doubt that when these sleeping sheep are left behind when the bridegroom comes for his bride, they will wake up and attend wholeheartedly to the task of strengthening or establishing their brothers. Isn't this the example Peter set, having denied the Lord initially, failing to go to the cross with him, but sometime later rising up to serve with unfailing faith? He strengthened his brothers in the Lord until the time appointed for his arrival at the cross, to which he willingly went. The teaching about this turning back and strengthening Peter's brothers seems to be further developed in John 21. The second triple. Peter denied the Lord three times, thus another triple in the account of Gethsemane. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you've denied three times that you know me. Luke 22, verse 34. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Luke 22, verse 61. This triple continues the theme of a test of willingness to be martyred that was previously established in the tripled naming. Consider the various gospel accounts and the context where the prophecy about the denials is made. Here's a verse that immediately precedes and two that immediately follow it. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Luke 22, verse 33. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing, too. Matthew 26, verse 35. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Mark 14, verse 31. Is there any question that the denials came in the face of just such a threat as suffering and death? There are hidden time elements in Luke 22, verse 34 and 61. Did you notice the appearance of the words three times? These words notify the watchful student of prophetic context that the time of a resurrection is in view. See resurrection on the third day. Have you ever heard a rooster that sounds a bit like a shofar? Imagine the sound of the trumpet call of God and the shout of the archangel announcing a harvest of men in the earth. Immediately after Peter denied the Lord for the third time, the rooster crowed, Quick, get up, comes to mind. Resurrection morning comes to mind. 
The sun is up. The bridegroom is here. Consider also how the rooster crowing watch is the third watch of the night, the watch shown by many proofs to be the resurrection watch. See also Passing Through the Iron Gate, Part 1. The phrase rooster crowing, elector phaneo, is found in many scriptures, but all are found in the same context, that of Peter's denials. A very closely related word is found in only one verse. This verse lists each of the four night watches as they were known and observed at the time Roman forces occupied Israel. They are given in order. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. Mark 13, verse 35. There is a level where the phrase, when the rooster crows, references the cock crowing watch, which is the third watch of the night. Note that it is clearly in the context of our Lord's return. My point is that the antitypical fulfillment of what was prophesied in Peter's denials will occur at the close of this age, very near the time of the resurrections. The record of this man Simon Peter in the three denials relates a message about the church in its final days of the age. In denying the Lord, Peter represents those who will choose rather to deny him than to accept martyrdom. The Third Triple Now. At last we come to the heart of the passage. Let's read what happened in the garden according to Mark's Gospel. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them, and fell to the ground, and began to pray, that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Mark 14, verses 32 through 42. The incredible stress felt by our Lord at this time has been attributed by most students to his concern about his upcoming beating and crucifixion. But I submit to you that he was rather more concerned about those who were with him. It was very important to our Lord that his disciples were where they were supposed to be and doing what they were supposed to be doing at this time. Was it out of concern for his own benefit and well-being that he asked them to watch and pray? Did he once ask them to pray for him in his personal hour of need? No, not once, though we might assume that if they had been paying attention, they should have been praying for him. Yeshua's concern was for their benefit, so that they would not fall into temptation. Our Lord was entreating his Father on his own behalf, but entreating his disciples on their behalf. Beyond being a matter of concern for merely those disciples who were present, his overwhelming sorrow must have expressed his feeling for the multiplied thousands whom he knew would eventually follow in his footsteps. His sorrow is said to have been to the point of death, an expression used in the narrative not to enhance the dramatic impact, but to reveal truth. It speaks to me not only of the level of grief, but also of his foreknowledge of the martyrdom which would befall him and everyone who would take up his cross after him. Now, follow me closely here, because it's important that you understand about this temptation Jesus prayed they would not fall into. Since the disciples were unable to follow Yeshua's directive, they were sleeping and resting instead of watching and praying that they would not fall into temptation, 
we may reason that they did indeed fall. Had they been able to follow his simple directive, it follows logically that their prayer request would have been granted and they would not have fallen into temptation. And if they hadn't fallen, it must be assumed that their roles in the scenario would have played out differently. Since the Bible records that they were separated from him and scattered as sheep when the shepherd was struck, the implication is that, had they not fallen into temptation, they would have followed the shepherd, been beaten, and even been crucified along with him. It seems plain enough to me that the temptation was to deny the Lord in the face of martyrdom. This temptation couldn't merely have been to resist sin in a non-specific or general sense. The temptation to resist arrest or whatever abuse may come upon us for the Lord's sake must therefore be resisted. The strength to resist must come from the Lord, and this is why we must stay awake and pray. The ability is not found in our flesh because it is weak. See Matthew 26 verse 41. But, and here's the key, the spirit is willing. And with that willingness is sufficient ability to keep a person from falling into temptation. Self-preservation is just not to be our concern, which goes against all our natural survival instincts and tendencies. We are to put even our very lives in the Lord's hand and trust entirely in His provision. If He wants to preserve this life which is ours to steward, so be it. If not, so be it. Let it be according to the Master's will. If it is truly His life you are living, you will adopt this attitude and find great reward in the kingdom to come. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Mark 8, verses 34 through 35. Continuing along this same line of teaching, we should understand the matter of the cup Jesus prayed about. At the time he prayed about the cup, we should note that he had just previously spoken of it at the Last Supper. And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. Luke 22, verses 20 through 21. The cup is the new covenant in his blood. The blood represents his life. See Leviticus 17, verse 11. The cup contains and represents his blood which is poured out. The cup is mentioned in the account of the Last Supper, followed immediately by the mention of the betrayer, exactly like here at Gethsemane. The cup is further associated with Yeshua's death. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 25 and 26. So, the cup is Yeshua's cup, but others will also drink from it. This means that the lives of others would also be poured out as a willing sacrifice. Martyrs. He was speaking to the sons of Zebedee in the following verse. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Matthew 20, verses 22 through 23. And so they did drink of his cup, as history records. Martyrdom continues to be the lot for true disciples of Messiah and will be for some time to come. Drinking from this cup is far more than the religious ritual of sipping grape juice while sitting in a church pew, isn't it? Those who truly eat that bread and drink the Lord's cup don't usually do it sitting in a pew, and their offering doesn't just go in a plate or basket. It requires the ultimate sacrifice. Now, I'd like to address some of the features of the focal passage of this triple in Mark that signal a specific last day's application. 
our Lord had separated himself from his disciples and rejoined them three times, praying each time while he was gone and returning to address them. When we read about our Lord returning the third time, in verse 41, the author is calling our attention to the time of a resurrection. On one level, these three cycles correspond to the first three of the seven famine years. It can be seen in Mark and from Matthew 26:47 that it was during the third time Yeshua addressed the sleepy disciples that the one doomed to destruction arrived. This speaks of the arrival of the lawless one during the third time or year. When the lawless one foreshadowed by Judas in the garden does arrive in his appointed time, Jesus will certainly be engaging in addressing his disciples about staying awake and praying that they would not fall into temptation. Since all the events under consideration occurred on the thirteenth day of the first month, this passage has a crucial application in the very day that the lawless one is revealed. Adding further support to that insight, Judas appears directly in the record as a type of the lawless one, betraying Yeshua to those who had come to arrest him. The betrayal was a handing over through identifying the particular man as the one they sought. Judas betrayed him with a kiss, a sign of affection. Judas's show of affection could not have been sincere, but deceitful, probably intended to conceal his wicked deed. Deceit is the dominant theme in the working of the lawless one, according to Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 11. Division of the Church Yeshua's very deliberate separation of his troop into three is a parable of the division of the church into three. This very peculiar separation is what initially seized my attention. This simple insight opened the way for a series of discoveries that includes the observation that the Mount of Olives is a symbol of division, everything you've been reading here about Gethsemane, the threefold separation of the church, and even the bride theft. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them, and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. Mark 14, verses 32-35 Within the corporate body of the church, there are a very small number who follow the pattern of our Lord, a larger number who follow the pattern of Peter, James, and John, and a far larger number who follow the pattern of the remaining disciples. These divisions or companies might also be labeled according to the sequence of naming in the first triple I addressed as the Simon, Simon, and Peter companies. The first two names referring to the church-type man are Simon, which is to say that these two companies are characterized by having hearing ears. These are first the bride, and then the saints of Revelation 7, 9. They hear and obey, submitting to the Lord, even unto following the way of the cross. The Peter company is comprised of the insubstantial stone people, who never develop ears to hear and subsequently deny the Lord to save their own lives. They will never learn obedience. They are, in tabernacle terminology, the outer court Christians, furthest from the throne. The bride is the most holy place company, and the Revelation 7-9 saints the holy place company. The Simon bride are the barley crop, who will be harvested at Pesah. The second Simon company are the wheat, who will be harvested at the following Shavuot. And the Peter company will be the grapes and other crops harvested at a much later Sukkot. Gethsemane. What a rich lesson we learn from the experience in the garden. May we learn it well. Pray, my friends. Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. This concludes our presentation of the Testimony of Gethsemane, Part 3, Your Final Exam. Thank you for listening.